for the, this is a neuroblastoma fan club, so just uh, I hope uh, I'm going to spark you some energy here because you, know, you look like a little bored. Um, <laughs> so I'm going to try to challenge you that what you, we've learned from, you know, uh, all the talks that we had today and all we've learned, maybe not everything is true or maybe not everything is true in nowadays. So let me, uh, I'm just going to talk about high risk neuroblastoma. So forget a low risk, low risks are cured thanks to our surgeons, that's it. Thank you, surgeons. You cure 50% of us. But those uh, high risk neuroblastomas, this is really very difficult to cure here in New York or anywhere. Um, and this is very simply said. This is a very sick kid that comes with metastatic disease, MIBG, so important MIBG. And you only need the date of birth above 18 months of age. They present very sick. And also unique, uh, you need to test MIGN. That's all you need to know that this is a high-risk neuroblastoma, all right? So then um, I'm gonna take over from what uh, Leif uh, has already mentioned. This is basically the backbone of therapy that we used worldwide. So this is an induction chemotherapy after, after biopsy. I don't know why the renal tumors we don't biopsy, a close parenthesis, but we all biopsy, then we do neo, uh, neoadjuvant chemotherapy, which we call induction chemotherapy and surgery. I don't, don't agree with a delay surgery. We can discuss that later. So <laughs> why are you delaying surgery if you want to avoid uh, chemo resistance? That concept I did not understand, but we discuss later. So we do early surgery and uh, chemotherapy, and then everybody calls consolidation. Consolidation of what? Consolidation of what you've done before, right? So the better you do here, the least intensive you have to be in your consolidation. That's Simple, simple concept. So everybody now uh, uh, talks about high dose chemotherapy and transplant as the standard. And I'm going to challenge you that this is not true. So, and then radiation, and then in the past we did cis-retinic acid because we thought it worked, and now we're talking about immunotherapy. So, all right, so this is the result. This is the result from what I told you. Terrible, you know? It's terrible. Uh, you know, in the 1960s, 70s, 80s, at best we cured 20 plus percent of cases. That's with the standard I mentioned. So we did very poorly, right? So our, uh, and this is the most recent study um, published with that old schema. And this is not that long ago. It was published in 2020. So that's only three years ago. The German group, they did not use any immunotherapy. They did all the standard, as I showed you. And look at the results. The results are really 30%. This is what we can cure in Germany, you know, high-income countries. I'm not asking everywhere else. 30% with the standard management, non-immunotherapy era. You aim for 30% cure rate. That's it. So the question is why we fail. Why are we not curing many more cases? So um, we do fairly well with induction chemo. We lower the burden of the disease. Our surgeons take out as much disease as possible. So we lower the amount of the disease and we keep lowering down and down. And eventually, maybe a career score of two or three or zero. Why not zero? It's the best, right? So complete remission. So let's say you achieve complete remission. But we know that everybody has disease despite achieving complete remission because this is what we call um, minimal residual disease. Right? And this is where we fail mostly because in, you know, we get to down here to most of our patients. Not everybody, 80%, maybe you know, 70%, whichever. But we get, so we failed here. So our you know, predecessors, they worked out two strategies for minimal residual disease, two strategies. One was antigen immunotherapy, which was discovered by Nai Kong Chang in 1985. So very long time ago. So we're not talking immune checkpoint inhibitor, you know, 15 years ago. We're talking 35 years ago. And that was, you know, by chance. And many, many years later, we learned a lot. And I'm going to squeeze all the data here. So we know the antibodies. It attaches to the antigen, which, uh, you know, neuroblastoma expresses very highly and homogeneously, different from any other tumor type. And then this anti antigen-antibody reaction sparks the, you know, enhances the 
effectivity of all the innate, innate immune system, and those cells kill the neuroblastoma. And that's how you know, we learned it worked, and it worked. And look at this. This is the antibody, antigen antibody, radio-labeled, and attaching to, you know, engaging to all the metastatic sites and all the primary sites. This image has never been shown for a CAR-T, never. We don't know how CAR-Ts work. We actually don't know if the CAR-T attaches to the antigen, but antibody uh, really attaches to the antibody. So anyway, let's follow up. So this is the sequential studies performed at MSK in New York, whereby they showed that we using the same backbone, chemo, radiation, surgery, plus antibody alone, so they achieved 40% um, uh, long-term survival. So look, that's 10 years, 15 years, this is cure. So that was really in the 1990s, really surprising. When they added GMCSF, only IV GMCSF, they went up, and when we added subcutaneous GMCSF, we really went very high up. That was really interesting, but then came, you know, of course, the randomized study, by the COG, where they, by they showed two years, um, actually two years, EFS and OS improvement after the patient had achieved complete remission with the immunotherapy. All right, so that was the formal proof. And I need to remind my colleague prior, the Cyopen never ran a randomized study. They just showed, compared to the historical controls, and they showed similar outcomes with immunotherapy. That's fine, so we got these very nice st uh, studies showing that immunotherapy can deal with MRD, all right? So that's very interesting. The other approach that was uh, historically devised to deal with uh, MRD was high-dose chemotherapy. And that's what everybody in oncology did in the 1990s. Even for breast cancer, for lung cancer, we transplanted everybody, everybody. So, and in neuroblastoma, as uh, my colleague said before, they, in 1999, the COG showed this very, very famous curve, which my colleague also showed. But I want to remark my colleague that you missed one slide, and I'm going to show it to you. Because that red line, it is true. They show it transplant with that induction therapy, which is completely different from what we do now. But anyway, and this retinic acid seemed to be better than uh, anything else. But you missed this slide my colleague. 15 years later, the same COG said, I'm sorry, the statistics were wrong. And they said, and that JCO. And they apologized to every single family that participated in that study because they said, okay, neither myelobletive therapy and autologous stem cell nor cis retinoic acid improved uh, OS. So you missed that slide. You're um, so you m maybe wanna, uh, so basically, after the randomized study from COG, there, were, there had been three randomized studies in neuroblastoma, and neither of them have shown to improve OS, meaning patients, yes, improved event free survival, high dose chemotherapy, dose intensity, tandem transplant, as you mentioned, improved event free survival, but none of them shown to improve overall survival. That's the data. Except for the uh, Alice Hughes paper showing that, yes, antibody improved overall survival, not even survival. So it's the opposite. It's very interesting. It is, right? Um, well, this is a data from the papers. It's not my, my conclusions. So anyway, um, nowadays, and again, both strategies, high-dose chemotherapy and transplant, were never tested independently because, um, you know, the, the antibody uh, post um, in the COG study was tested for patients having received prior uh, um, high dose chemo. All right, so this nowadays, where we are, we have different antibodies now in the clinic, not everywhere in the world, unfortunately. Actually, I would say in the minority parts of the world, we have antigen 2 antibodies available. And we have the fa dinotuximab family of antibodies, and we have the naxitabab antibody, which is the one that we help developing. So this is a very recent antibody. This is a humanized antibody, naxitamab, which was uh, patented in 2011. And first patient was treated at our center, June 2017, and in a track record, in three years, got approved by the FDA in the States. 
So this is an outpatient treatment, which is basically subcutaneous GM-CSF for 10 days, plus three doses of three milligrams per kg intravenous short infusion. This is all outpatient. In a total of nine milligrams per kg, total of 270 milligrams per meter square uh, per cycle. And that's basically what we did. And that was, I'm gonna uh, go faster, uh, because this is what we did in our institution. So basically, uh, patients coming uh, for immunotherapy, and then um, they were evaluated, fully evaluated, MIBGs, um, uh, bone marrow studies, whole body MRI, and then if the patient was found to have refractory disease, um, uh, then they move on refractory disease, um, but stable, so like this patient coming after induction, um, you, you know, you give the induction you want, you do the surgery, chemo, and then the patient is evaluated, and the patient has persistent disease in the bone compartment. Curie score of 18, so, uh, you know, really refractory disease, hard to, hard to cure these patients. If you look at the literature, the response rates on these patients, only with chemo, it's about 10 to 35%. Uh, with MIBG therapies, famous studies, more than 25 studies, the objective response is about 32%. That's the literature. And so basically what we did is those persistent refractory disease, we decided to treat with uh, immunotherapy. So that particular patient came in, we showed that it's a uh, you know, Curie score of six after two cycles of immunotherapy. So only antibody, patient with refractory disease in the bone, only antibody, two cycles, Curie score down to six. And uh, these are the persistent uh, MIBG spots um, five cycles, Curie score of zero, that's it. So bone refractory disease, only with antibody, you can take care of. These are very potent antibodies, and this is the 201 trial. The results were presented at uh, SIOP uh, last year in Barcelona, and this is the summary that I showed you. Those are for refractory relapse cases in the bone and or bone marrow only, no sub-tissues. Sub-tissues, our surgeons take care of. Um, if you're lucky. So this is basically the uh, results. I'm gonna go uh, very fast. Um, objective response rate, 50%. Um, complete responses, 38%. So only antibody, 38% of the cases, we take care completely of the, um, uh, the disease. And we showed responses in all the uh, disease subtypes. I'm gonna skip that in, for the sake of time. So you compare in the literature, I told you salvage chemotherapy 10 to 35% objective responses. I showed you 38% complete responses. MIBG therapy 32% objective responses. I show you 38% complete responses. So only with antibody. And this is uh, what we can do now for our patients. Primary refractory bone disease, which is the most difficult to treat, we can take care only with antibodies. So this is what we have available now in our armamentarium. Um, and so that's a very nice case. But um, I'm gonna go to uh, something else. So what about patient coming in, um, evaluated, uh, showed to be uh, having persistent disease um, here, evaluated, received antibody, did not get into complete remission. Keeps being persistent, refractory. So we, what we do now, anti-GD2 plus chemo the same as the COG. So look at this patient. This is an amazing patient, um, 32 years of age, okay? So this is an ATRX mutated, um, uh, as you know, and also telomere positive and so on. Um, so this is, this is not a bone scan, this is an MIBG scan. So all this skeleton is full of disease, all right? So she had received uh, autologous transplant, several rounds, you know, multiple rounds of chemotherapy, allo transplant, you name it, you know, for 32 years of age, more than 10 years of disease. So she had received everything. So she received naxitamab, nothing happened. So, you know, primary refractory, very refractory. So then we decided, okay, we're gonna follow a COG um, pattern, a chemoimmuno. So we use naxitamab, irinotic, and timozolomide. Chemoimmunotherapy hits. So this is what you see, you know? Two cycles, that's it. Clear, complete response. So when you see that, you say, wow, this is amazing. You, in my career, I don't see these things so often. So there is some magic in the chemoimmuno combination as the COG showed. So basically, um, what we do for our HEAT trial is to include soft tissue um, because our surgeons were not able to remove everything, persistent disease, uh, or refractory disease by all means. So these are the patients with this persistent uh, soft tissue site in the hilum of the uh, liver. 
very, very uh, difficult, if not possible, to remove, and so on. So basically, in patients with responsive or stable disease on refractory disease, um, we showed uh, that this is the HITS uh, compared to the COG. Basically, it's a similar strategy with uh, antibody, the anaxidemab GM, and uh, irinotican, uh, irinotican and timozolomide, high doses of timozolomide, though. This is an outpatient uh, regimen as well. And uh, we treated in our center 50 by 55 patients. Um, this is the summary. And basically, the, we showed the, sa the same as the COG. It's 40% uh, objective responses. In those very, very difficult cases, including 29% uh, 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 of complete responses, like the one I showed you. So there is potential there, and I'm gonna skip all these um, because this is not really relevant. So chemoimmuno is another strategy that we can use for the worst case scenario in those very, very refractory diseases. This is an outpatient, and we see the responses very early on. So those who are gonna respond after two cycles, gone. You, are taking care, you have taken care of this very difficult disease. And um, uh, I'm not gonna skip this because this is very interesting, but, uh, but I, we don't have that. So uh, my final uh, story is um, what can we do for patients that achieve complete remission? So let's go to the best case scenario. Patients coming in with um, your induction therapy, whichever you use, chemo and surgery. They come in and they are in complete remission, complete remission, curie zero. Uh, bone marrows are negative, uh, conventional. Minimal residual disease, we evaluate, I'll show you the data. Everything is negative by conventional uh, strategies. So what we do, okay, forget about transplant. We're going straight to antibody and radiation, that's it. So what, what happened? Well, when we do that, um, MIBG score of zero, so this is a patient in complete remission, we published this data in PVC 2021 for 55 patients. So, I'm gonna summarize here. First year patients, so the same as the COG. Patients in complete remission post-transplant, they say two-year event-free survival uh, and two-year event-free uh, overall survival. So this is our uh, data, uh, only 55 patients. I know this is not the COG, of course. But I can tell you, without transplant, 55 patients, similar, not better. I'm not saying it's better, I'm saying it's similar. You can achieve similar results without transplant, with uh, antibody and radiation. That's it, all right? So this is, that was two year, uh, two year data outcome. Uh, the COG just recently, October 2022, they updated the results of those patients treated on uh, immunotherapy post-transplant and, um, you know, amazing number of patients, 600 plus. Uh, at five years, so patients uh, more than 18 months of age, stage four, you have to look at in the data in detail. Five year event for survival, the best outcome ever published. So this is the benchmark today in neuroblastoma. Five year event for survival, 57%, great. Um, and 70%, 71 close, overall survival. So we need, that, we need to get there. This is the best you can reach with your patients, all right? So I went back, and this is published as of last year. So I said, okay, I'm gonna update my outcome data on patients treated without transplant, only with immunotherapy. We published this for 82 patients. 82 patients, 82 stage four high-risk neuroblastomas, managed without transplant, only with immunotherapy, all right? When we do the multivariate analysis, uh, those patients who had received transplant in their institutions coming in uh, with us, yes, they have a better uh, event-free survival, no uh, overall survival, like all the, tr the data that is published. We reproduce that. And the MRD, because we use um, uh, you know, MRD evaluation for all our patients coming in, patient it's declared uh, in complete remission, but still you detect at yeah, the minimal residual disease. This is also um, uh, uh, pronostic, uh, so this is correlating with event free survival, not with overall survival. So, and uh, with, you know, the Cox models, only the MRD correlates with event free survival, not with overall survival. So the, this is the final results. Basically, we edited our results like with uh, COGD, right? So five year event free survival COG, post transplant, 57%. Our data without transplant, um, 80 pa patients, 57. Not better, I'm not saying we're doing better. I'm saying for this subgroup of cases, we can reach exactly the si similar, not exactly, similar outcome 
best outcome without the need of transplant. And overall survival similar 70 plus. So all I'm saying to you is I challenge you that what we did in the past is not necessarily true today in the era of antibody. And I need to acknowledge to everybody, and I know that antibodies are not available in most parts of the world, and we should be working on getting antibodies to everybody, not to do more transplants to everybody. This is my point. So we should uh, you know, treat these patients in super specialized centers. I don't know about Armenia, because this is a small country, but we need to send these patients to highly specialized center centers. That's, you know, it, it, this works for everybody, and we need to work towards less toxic, less costly, and more accessible treatments for high risk neuroblastoma in the world. So this is my proposal to you, wherever you go, Japanese or um, every game is over. Thank you. Um, so the game is over for transplant. Uh, for some of the patients, I'll tell you, we don't need to transplant. We don't need to induce so much toxicity to our patients, or at least to some of our patients. Maybe biologically we can strategize uh, better, but we can reduce all this therapy towards uh, much uh, easier, easier uh, treatment. Thank you for your attention. Thank you.